do the audio. <laughs> the video port but it's not making it to so the just as they're getting that started sorry you guys I don't mean to trick you as I pull the port um, so just a little bit of background so um, I'm on the steering committee for indigenous climate action and it's um, been in existence for about a year or so they had their first meeting in 2015 uh, and then another meeting 2017 of January and uh, this past year they hired five core staff members and uh, we had a steering committee meeting in March of this year to really solidify our vision, our mission, what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And um, what makes Indigenous Climate Action key is that it's Indigenous-led, primarily female or women-led um, organization. And our mandate is to support Indigenous communities in coming up with Indigenous-led solutions to climate change. And it's how we can address and mitigate some of the effects that we're expecting to see in our communities. So yesterday I had mentioned that Indigenous peoples, we contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions around the world, yet our communities are impacted the most and often the first. And so, um, and we're not sitting at the table, we're not at the table when it comes to the federal, provincial, municipal levels of government or the rural municipalities in developing climate policy. And so First Nations and Indigenous peoples, we've been forced to the streets, basically, to take our message and get our voice out there. You see us marching, you see us taking things out to demonstrations, to stand up, we're right literally in the path of pipelines, putting our bodies, putting constructions in place to try to stop some of these developments from infringing in our territories. Um, and, and we're looking to bring together um, a collective Indigenous voice as well, just as me, none of you speak for everybody in your group or community, um, the same with us. So we're looking to develop a collective, and every region has its own challenges and issues. So what is needed in Haida Gwaii will be different from what we need here in the Treaty 4, Capel area, uh, what's needed up in um, Athabasca, Chippewa First Nation, up in those regions, out in the east as well. Should be on the They've got it handled, I think. And so we're looking to really put together um, these solutions. And so I'm going to share a little bit about um, Indigenous Climate Action. I do want to start with a video just because it really has a nice summary of uh, what we're talking about and why it's so important that we come together to do this. And um, supporting this organization is one of the key ways that you can help us in addressing climate change issues. So I really like Alex's presentation with One House, Many Nations because it shows what we can do when we have an indigenous-led solution to climate change. Yesterday we talked about um, the systemic issues of, of globalization and how a lot of the solutions need to be coming from our own ecosystems, from the area that we call home. And um, One House, Many Nations does that because it's using some of the materials from that eco-region. And so then those materials are better suited to withstand the climate and the changes that will be coming for that area. There are things happening on the land that are very disturbing. Some of the elders can the water has gone too cold. The elders can't predict a lot of the weather patterns or what is known in our traditional ecological knowledge. It's affecting the maple. It affects the trees. Some of the birds are not even flying south anymore. The medicines that we used to be able to find, we can't find them anymore. But we know that the animals are going to suffer. And if the animals suffer and the land suffers, we're going to suffer. Communities are slipping into the ocean in the Arctic, or their houses are literally sinking into the permafrost. And it feels like the only people that are like being like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Have been indigenous communities calling for an end to these things. Transition needs to happen now. We need to stop doing what we've been doing and begin something new. That's where this idea of Indigenous Climate Action 
has really come from. This idea that Indigenous peoples aren't just the first to be impacted, but can be the first people to provide solutions that are grounded in more than just economic solutions. Canada and its whole system, its whole economic paradigm, is fundamentally out of sync with what real, tangible action on climate looks like. What I see from grassroots movements like ICA, Idle No More, they're putting together plans that are ambitious and something that actually reflects the type of knowledges that we're talking about all the time when we talk about indigenous knowledge. We are our own experts. We don't have to translate ourselves all the time through the lens of the mainstream. We want to work towards a recognition of our fundamental role as, uh, as the leaders in this discussion. Because we can't just be addressing climate from a science perspective. We have to be addressing it from a human rights perspective and an indigenous rights perspective. Indigenous climate actions and other indigenous-led initiatives and mobilizations are going to be critical to making that happen in the most effective way. share a little bit um, about what we're doing now with Indigenous Climate Action. So, um, so that's a video just to introduce what we're doing uh, and why it's so vital that we are moving forward with this. Um, and um, Ariel Duranger is the Executive Director of Indigenous Climate Action um, and an old friend of mine. And she had um, invited people from across many different territories to come together to have these conversations. So we are having these conversations. We are mobilizing at the Indigenous level. Um, but one of the biggest problems that we are facing, uh, just like all of us, is um, capacity, resources, uh, that kind of thing. So. Um, you know, so you heard a bit about what we do, and our mission is really to focus on Indigenous-led solutions to climate change, and going to the communities and finding out how are you experiencing climate change, what are you noticing when it comes to the land and 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 um, the weather patterns, and what do you, what does your community need to address it? So we're looking to shape our own policy, our own actions in addressing this at the community level. So one of the biggest things that we're doing right now is putting together an Indigenous Climate Change Toolkit. Uh, because like I said, Indigenous peoples are not at the tables for these talks and we aren't getting the resources that we need. So we're um, going to different communities and hosting climate workshops to ask communities what is it that you need? How are you experiencing climate change and then what do you need to address it? And it might be something as simple and as basic um, as education for the people. What is climate change? How can we address it? Or it could be uh, deeper into resources or supporting projects like One House, Many Nations or other projects that are taking place across our territories. So our two main targets um, are to increase community understanding about climate change, and this includes both scientific knowledge as well as our indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, um, and then to create a collective indigenous position on climate change um, that respects different territories, different linguistic groups, different ways of connecting to the land. Um, but basically we are on the front lines and, and our voice isn't at these tables, so it's really important that we um, are included in all conversations because we are impacted by all of the policies that are developed, um, drafted, and implemented by all levels of government. Um, so this is going to be a teaching tool to share basic climate change information and resources for communities uh, to help communities understand climate change, both um, what's happening locally, but also through a cultural lens, um, because we do describe it in different ways. Yesterday I mentioned, um, you know, we don't have models that showcase, you know, the the coming um, expected temperature changes uh, to our climate. Um, but our, our models or the way we're receiving information is through our um, ceremonial institutes and my husband will speak a bit about that. Um, but in, in our ceremonies, we have been warned, we have been told hard times are coming, you must prepare. And we are being given direct guidance on how to address this and how serious this is. So a lot of us that go to ceremony that take these questions to the lab, to, to spiritual guidance, um, we're not we're not sugarcoating it. We're not couching that. Oh, we're going to have to like really step up and make some changes. We're really talking in extreme language because that's what we're being told, and 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 that's what the IPCC report has indicated as well is that we don't have much time to make some extreme changes on that massive scale. Um, and a lot of it is systemic. 
Um, so we're looking to do um, ongoing community gatherings and really mobilizing and understanding what climate means, climate change means to all Indigenous peoples. So the climate change workshops are happening. Uh, I'm organizing one um, uh, for November um, in the Treaty 4 area, so that may be happening in Fort Capel or on the Okanese First Nation. Uh, they are really forward, they're, they've just established uh, climate monitoring stations in their community so they can start monitoring the effects and so they're very open to, to taking some forward action on this. Um, other communities want to, but they just don't have the leadership in their community. And so, um, again, it's about community, um, grassroots level organizing. Um, so that's basically what we do. We also have our gatherings where um, you saw the video. Uh, my husband and I were at that gathering. I was at the one um, in Ottawa in March. And again, defining uh, our organization and how we're going to move forward. Um, you know, and we do need help and resources, uh, but we're also very particular about where we get our funding from. We've drafted very specific funding principles. Um, and and um, last year, actually, Indigenous Climate Action turned down um, some money uh, through the uh, Aviva Fund um, because of the source um, of that parent company. And so um, we ended up getting a donation, an anonymous donation, for that exact same amount that we refused. It was $100,000, which would have uh, made a huge difference for operational costs for that year, and that ended up coming through. Um, but it's very important to us that we have um, strict guidelines on, on who we align with. Um, so the other thing that you'll see on this website that we're providing is information on Indigenous rights. So you may have heard of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is a very significant um, um, a document. It was drafted um, over a 20-year period by Indigenous people, so it took a long time to come together, um, but a lot of discussion um, to put this forward. Um, Canada uh, actually voted against the declaration initially, um, and then it has been um, accepted in principle, um, but nothing really has happened since then. Um, but one of the important things to understand about um, Indigenous rights and responsibilities to the land is that as communities, all communities, not just Indigenous communities, start mobilizing and organizing to put a stop to certain developments, um, to uh, fossil fuel extraction, um, that it's our Indigenous and inherent rights to the land that we have um, a legal framework to, to back us up so that uh, people who want to put a stop to certain, um, whether it's pipelines or other um, industries um, that continue to dig up fossil fuels and contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we, can, we, we legally have a right to stop those on our territories. Um, so one of the things to consider is um, prior informed Hmm? Free. Free, free prior informed consent. Thank you, and um, you know, and that, and and making sure that that is upheld. And so, you know, we really need all Canadians and other people to stand with us to uphold these. Um, so, when we talk about decolonizing the transition, uh, yesterday I really spoke about decolonizing. Really starts in the mind, and that it, it's a mindset. And so, to really think about how. Um, how willing people are to change. When we're talking about a systemic change, to change all of our systems, um, that includes these ideas of dominion and empire and taking and to share. And so we're looking at not just transitioning how we get our power, when we're talking about the electrical grid, we're talking about how we're going to transition power, this concentrated amount of power right now that's held by a few, and, and dispersing that power to people in our own communities, indigenous peoples, um, workers, people of all different areas who um, really have the right to, to determine what happens in their own lives and in their own communities. Uh, I could go on, but I know we do have a, a short amount of time, and Philip also has some things to say. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, beyond just what we're doing at Indigenous Climate Action, um, is ways that you can support our work. Um, so when you go to the website, uh, which is just indigenousclimateaction.com, um, there's five major ways that you can support us right now. So I would just, because I don't have the time to go in depth with everything we're doing, go to the website, all the resources are there. We have resources on, yeah, go to the tools and resources for indigenous rights. We have webinars that we host. Um, there's a network there of other uh, organizations that we're partnering with that are doing this work, um, which we're all familiar with partnering with other organizations so that we can strengthen our voices. Um, but go and check this out, and then come to um, I say here, share our work, I mean, get on your social media networks and just help amplify our voices. Uh, we have a Facebook group or an Instagram, um, you can join our mailing list, join our webinar, share that information. 
We're always looking for volunteers. Uh, of course, with all of us that are doing this incredibly important work, um, a lot of it is volunteer. Um, so we're looking for that. Um, you can support our partners. So we've got the Tiny House Warriors, Pacific People's Partnership. There's a, a number of them right there. Lupcom Solar, uh, Indigenous Environmental Network, and Red Tide um, organizations as well, like what Alex was talking about with One House Many Nations. Um, but really, honestly, um, help uh, donate. Uh, we have a core staff of five, and we have so much work. Um, I had mentioned yesterday that our communities are spread so thin um, with, a, with a myriad of crises, and so and this is just one of many. Um, but it, it, it's the, the most important one, in, in my opinion. Uh, but you can donate a one-time donation, or you can become a sustainer, which is a monthly donation as well. Um, so because we... We do need to increase our capacity to do this work at the uh, community level. The only other things that I wanted to leave you with before I hand it over to Philip um, is decolonizing the transition means supporting um, indigenous-led solutions. So the things that Alex was talking about with One House Many Nations is a very tangible, um, solid indigenous-led solution. Um, indigenous climate action is supporting those types of initiatives, so we're looking to support those communities and getting those types of projects up and off the ground and taking action on them because we can't wait for our leadership and we certainly can't wait for the Canadian government because they're, we can't wait for anybody to help us, so we're just doing it ourselves. Um, but what we're asking for is people um, like yourselves, allies, to support the work that we're doing to help amplify our voices. Um, because the indigenous-led solutions are going to be what's, what's going to address a lot of the systemic problems that we're seeing when it comes to climate change and the contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we're talking about a just transition. That's a whole focus of this two-day conference uh, and summit. And so when I want to talk about justice, you know, justice and laws um, are not always in alignment. So there are many, many laws in place. Um, living an indigenous lifestyle and doing the work, the, the, the vital work we're doing right now, um, will often lead us to be criminalized. Um, the laws are in place when we're trying to go and gather our medicines, gather our food, put houses up, you know, our, 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 our self, um, our rights, our autonomy, all of that um, has been criminalized. And so um, in order to see justice, uh, we're often being forced to break the law and we're standing up and protesting in the streets. Uh, but the laws aren't always just. And if you look at social justice in the history of when, when major changes happened, you see about the, the civil rights movement down in the U.S. and who is walking in the streets. And look at right now with climate justice, who's walking in the streets. And I really want to call and ask all of you to step up your game and to stand with us. If you believe in justice, change your laws. Stand with us so that we're not the ones putting our lives on the line. We're risking our children by getting arrested to make these changes in our community. So you must be willing to stand with us. And that you, you can say you stand for justice, but it's your actions that matter. And principles only matter when they're inconvenient to uphold. So if you are not willing to risk your comfort for us, then I don't believe that you stand for justice. I want to see you there with us, supporting these organizations and allowing an indigenous led movement to take place. I'm going to pass it on to Philip. He also has a lot to say about this. or Philip Ross. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, that's a really tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, when I was, I was searching on, on, you know, in this limited time, what, what, what to talk about, and uh, it, it came to me, I guess I should, I should speak about uh, some of our, our traditional institutes as Indigenous peoples here in Treaty 4. Um, and what the, the, the spiritual value and the spiritual relationships that exist and that were uh, 
<coughs> cemented when uh, when that very sacred covenant was uh, was negotiated and signed um, here in this territory. It's not an easy thing to talk about. Um, I got a couch just a little bit. I've been feeling under the weather. I'm a little bit fluish and not feeling very uh, clear, clear minded and. Um, I also get very emotional often when talking about this, this sort of thing. And especially when we talk about treaty, it's something that's we're often warned to be very cautious when, when we discuss that. Um, because of the spiritual uh, connotations around it. Um, and I think that that's what is misunderstood by most uh, Canadians, is really to understand that the spiritual significance uh, that was set in motion with that agreement. Um, so I'll, I'll start by talking about a little bit about our, our spiritual institutes, and I guess maybe who I am a little bit. I mean, I'm not an elder. I'm 42 years old, but I started going on this path of learning and being what we call an escapeo, escapeo suck, uh, helping elders and working in ceremony about about 30 years ago, and I I dedicated my life to that service. Um, I'm not even a fluent Cree speaker or solo speaker, but I've spent a lot of my life on the land. I'm a hunter, um, fisherman, and I mean, not in a hobby sense. I mean, I'm a serious hunter. <laughs> and uh, I've also spent a lot of time in what we call, or in English we would call vision questing, actually fasting uh, on the prairie for four days, four nights at a time. I've done that many times in my life. Uh, I think over the course of my life, probably over 40 days, which is not something that's undertaken very often by too many people these days, and that's really been the foundation of my spiritual relationship with this place and this land here. Um, and so when we talk about Treaty 4, not only was it a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, agreement, uh, it was a spiritual contract, and the Indigenous uh, leaders at the time use our spiritual institutes. Some of them are called, like in English, you call it a shake tent, or other ones are called Dwell well, Wigamic Smoking Lodge. These are our, our traditional governance institutions. Um, but not only are they governance institutes, they are spiritual portals that are unique to this ecosystem. Um, they open up the spiritual realm and where we are, what Michelle was mentioning, where we receive messages from the spiritual realm, guidance, instruction, um, that kind of lets us know what's up and what's transpiring in our world. Because as indigenous peoples, we recognize that everything has spirit. The rocks, the water, the trees, all of it, it has consciousness. And it really is what governs life here on the planet. Um, I think about 1999, uh, I remember first beginning to uh, hear of uh, spirit beings in our ceremonies talking about very difficult times coming and to prepare for them, to prepare ourselves spiritually, uh, not only physically but spiritually. Um, because, and, and talking about why and what has happened, when we talk about the consequences, we have certain things in our lodges, uh, or in our teachings, certain values, there's things like wakotuin. Wakotuin is kinship and relationship, kind of a governing law on how we relate to the natural world and how we, how we keep ourselves in balance and within the caring capacity of our ecosystems. We have something called wakotuin, the breaking of natural law, um, and the consequences for that are, are deadly. Um, and our, our ancestors, when they entered the treaty, we understood that. We understood that about Western industrial civilization, that it was living a lie, it was living with Chinuan, and that the consequences were to come. And now they're upon us, 140 years later, we're seeing it come to fruition. So I won't... Uh, I, I won't, uh, you know, sort of say that, you know, that it's going to be easy going forward. And that's what we talk about preparing ourselves spiritually. For those of us who are, are, are woke, 
and are aware of, of, of what's, what's happening in our world, it's going to be difficult. We're going to try to attempt to build this uh, just transition, but we're going to have a lot of disappointments on the way. It's going to be imperfect and it's going to be sloppy. Um, and that's going to take a lot of spiritual fortitude and uh, strength in our minds and bodies and, and spirits. So talking about our spiritual institutes, um, I mean, we talk about grandfathers and grandmother beings. There's many beings here, and, and, and each each ecosystem has a different has different uh, spiritual beings that inhabit that eco region. You know, some of the some of the ones here. You know, we, we always acknowledge Pasqua Mustus, You know, the uh, chief buffalo spirit, Ogimau Piesu, chief thunderbird, Wapski Piesu. Old Man Thunderbird, Bakwisimo Piesu, the, uh, the uh, Rain Dance Lodge Thunderbird, Kaskateo you know, Piesu, the Black Thunderbird. Those, those spirit beings and many others uh, speak to us in our lodges. And I remember some years ago someone putting a question out there. They said, what about this climate change? What do we do about it? What is it? And those spirit beings, they speak in an ancient dialect of, uh, of, well, any indigenous language, but here in our ceremony is an ancient dialect of Cree. Uh, many of our, our Cree speakers can't even understand them, but we have some of our, our highest speakers who, who are able to translate those messages. And essentially, that walks the PAs who said, I am climate change, and I'll be walking the earth, cleansing it. Because of Tiniwan. Human beings have broken the natural laws, have exceeded the natural carrying capacities, have built a, a civilization not in alignment with the rest of our life relatives. So these things, as indigenous peoples, we understand these things through that spiritual lens uh, and that relationship. And we we obtain that ability to to receive those messages over over millennia of living sustainably, living humbly, we were able to access that spiritual well through that intimate relationship with our local ecosystems. As settler society, you can't necessarily replicate that. <laughs> that took thousands of years to to uh, for indigenous cultures to to establish those relationships with the spiritual realm. But what we can do is we can attempt to carry some of those values learned from cultures like that. And we have very complex issues. I mean, as indigenous peoples, we don't have all the answers for your civilization. <laughs> it's, it's very complex. Our civilizations were sustainable and have been sustainable for millennia. Um, it was, and, and some of the wisdom in, 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 those, in those are uh, their societies was their simplicity and was their resiliency and their ability to, to move and to, to shift with, uh, with changing weather and changing climates. We've built a very rigid civilization now and uh, there'll be consequences for that. And so I think going forward, what I'd, I'd like to share with you a little bit is, is, is just the, some of those simple teachings of the one I like to focus on is Wakoto, kinship. And that's a very loose translation. You know, Wakoto is, is governing laws that kind of oversee our relationship with one another in our family systems, in our, in our tribal systems, and as, as human beings. But not only does it govern that, it also sets out the blueprint of an understanding of how we relate to the natural world and how we observe it and we understand the relationships between other species and how they work in a reciprocal relationship. Uh, and then knowing how to build our societies within those natural functions and, and how to conduct ourselves in a sustainable way. Um, and so it's all really about not being human-centric. To be human-centric, you know, Indigenous peoples, we say there's no there's no chitting. You're you're breaking a natural law against the natural world, and only thinking about yourself and your own species, which is what this society does. We're always talking about economics. We're always talking about you know human rights. 
In our teachings, we put ourselves at the bottom. We put ourselves last. We take care of Kigawa, you know, our Mother Earth. She'll take care of us. Our other life relatives will take care of us. Don't think about ourselves. Put them first. And then the, that reciprocal relationship will return to God upon them. So I think going forward, as we think about solutions, it's that understanding that human beings, this earth doesn't need us. We need it. And we have to put ourselves below those other life relatives that support life for us. Um, So yeah, I mean, I could ramble all day and take it in many different directions, but um, I hope that that's a value for for some of you. I know that that's probably not a conversation that is spoken about in, in non-Indigenous circles. I mean, these are the conversations and things we have sometimes within some of our lodges. And you know, and it's, it's, it's true though too, I mean, pe people like myself and, and, and other knowledge carriers, we are a minority amongst our own people. You know, we're actually about 13% of us across the country still practice our traditional uh, institutions. And of, of that 13%, there's a, a smaller percentage of, the, of us who are actually connecting the dots and relating that to, the, to our current modern situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's rare, but it's precious. It's a very precious knowledge, and it uh, doesn't just end where it's what I've provided today. It, it can go on and on, but I would need, you know, the next five hours. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak a little bit, and uh, hopefully we can uh, create change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Been awesome.